On her website, she describes herself as a normal woman seeking the invisible. She wonders why, when everyone seems so concerned with the world we can see and feel and pay for, she spends much of her waking life looking to understand the stuff we can't see. The energy around us that runs the world, the invisible ever-ready bunny behind the scenes. I encourage you all to look at her website. It's fascinating. She's got a lot of wonderful information on there. Uh, in particular, look at her, uh, her ideas for TV shows and books. It's very enlightening. Uh, on there, it's from Proverbs, she has this quote, it is not the towering sail, but the invisible wind that moves the ship. So I invite you all to hoist your sail and welcome Joan Stefan Broadmeyer. Um, first thing that I always like to do when I speak is to ask people to just take a breath in. And I'll now lower your expectations. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm asking you to lower them. Oops, hello. I'm just going to stand on my microphone. Sorry about that. I'll put it in this here. Maybe that'll help. Um, I'm asking you, not, you know, you can lower your expectations for me because I'm not going to sit up here and tell you, give you brilliance. That's, you know, I can give you my life lessons, I can tell you what I've experienced in my life, but um, lower your expectations for me, raise your expectations for yourself because if there's anything that I would like to leave you with is the idea that you, you are the brilliance. You have the brilliance that's going to come and um, save the world. Um, I, <laughs> I have to tell you that I, uh, I have never really been a natural, well, I shouldn't say that. I have been living my life in the last few decades thinking that I'm not a speaker. And so for many years they would make me speak at different things when I was a news anchor or when I was working for Home and Garden, but I would always be very, very, very afraid. And I couldn't figure out, well, yeah, I kind of figured it out why. I went to UMD. And I thought at that time that I was going to be a communicator, a speaker, um, you know, that was going to do something. I was going to be in theater. I was going to do something that involved me speaking into the world. And I took a speech class first semester, freshman year, because I was so excited about it. And uh, I got in there. I won't tell you the woman's name for obvious reasons later. Um, and uh, I remember her saying, OK, put together a speech about something. Some, about something you care about, and um, come back and do like two, three minutes, something like that. So I did, and I was nervous. I mean, obviously, I, I, how much opportunity do you get a, to speak in front of groups by the time you're an 18-year-old college freshman? So I was a little nervous, but I got up, and I did it, and I thought, okay, I think I did fine. I'm not sure, but there was silence. There, was not, there wasn't any like uproarious applause or laughter or anything like that. And out of the silence came this woman's lone voice looking at me and saying, never do that again. I know, right? <laughs> I know. I like to say, tell that story every once in a while because I still enjoy being a victim occasionally. <laughs> you know? It was like, okay. Well, I went back to my dorm room and I literally sat in the dark sobbing because I thought, okay, that was my, that was my dream. Apparently I'm not good at it. And to her credit, she was having a horrible day, and she came back about a week later and slipped an apology note underneath my door. So, you know, she, she recognized what she had done. But, you know, in many ways, the damage was done. And the reason I really tell you that story is because while I'm speaking, I wouldn't mind if you're doing a little excavating and trying to remember some of those stories that might have been told to you that were what somebody else, it had meaning for somebody else but it really didn't have meaning for you. Or it, or it I hate to use the word shouldn't, but it, it, it didn't serve you for it to have meaning for you. And we all have those stories. You could probably tell a story about it from this past week where you know, you're walking down the street and somebody looks you up and down and goes, oh, oh yeah. You know, like, uh, what is she wearing? Or you know, who does she think she is? Um, the stories are out there um, all the time, you know. Uh, yeah, I feel this need to tell you that I am an... Anybody here an ENFP on the Myers-Briggs scale? ENFP! I knew it! I knew it! <laughs> I, the reason I tell you this is because ENFPs are notorious for living on tangents. It means extroverted, 
intuitive feeling and perceiving. It's all the really soft skills. And um, I tend to be a little tangential when I speak, so I just want to give you that heads up. In fact, they gave me a, they gave me a prayer when they uh, identified me as an ENFP. Uh, and the prayer is, dear God, please help me to focus. <gasps> Look, a bird! <laughs> And that's my prayer. So if you find, your, if you find yourself like going, well, where, where, where did she go? It's like, well, it's fine. I, I'll come back to whatever I was speaking about at some point. Um, but back to the, the speech class. In the speech class, they made it really clear that every speech, there are very specific rules about speeches and how they should be accomplished. Every speech should have a specific beginning, a specific middle, a specific end, and a very clear through line through all of that. This will not be that speech. <laughs> yeah, thanks, so good. Um, so I will begin with the end. <laughs> the end is be who you are. No, the end is remember who you are. See, Remember who you are, be who you are, share who you are, and change the world. So, if anybody wants to doze off now, you've got the, you got the bottom line. Um, you know, when, when you were introducing me, sometimes that, you know, it just sounds like I have this, you know, look at that life. It's like, yeah, she's got the National Emmy, and she's been at the White House, and she's done this, and she's, you know, had this job on television. And I have to tell you, that was, the, that, that was some of the most painful times in my life. I had joy within them. You know, because I, I, I got married to a wonderful guy, I had two beautiful kids, I've got a great dog. Um, but, um, but those times that look so polished and beautiful from the outside and successful, I mean, people identified that as success. Um, those are some of the most painful times that I can point to in my life. And um, I'm telling you, it was, it was probably, only about seven years ago when I finally figured out what was going on. I had been raised by wonderful people in Cambridge, Minnesota. I was born in Minneapolis. I was raised in Cambridge by a guy who was a construction worker and a stay-at-home mom. So I got a fair amount of attention and I always had clothes, even if they were homemade. And I always had good food and um, security that way. But I grew up thinking there was something wrong with me. Uh, my, my dad was very linear and, you know, perpendicular angles, that was per that's perpendicular, right? <laughs> and parallel lines, you know, it was, everything was kind of an, there was an architecture that you needed to fit within. Uh, that was his nature. And my mom was, um, if you weren't working, you weren't really being of any value to anybody. I mean, one of her favorite things to do, swear to whoever you want me to swear to, she loved getting down on her hands and knees and just wiping the floor. That was her joy, and she couldn't understand why I didn't find joy in that. <laughs> um, my sister, uh, loving, lovely person, science and engineering, that was the way her brain worked. It was just natural, it was who she was, and she was more like my mom. It's like, I will, she built her own barn, she, dra she cut down her own trees and dragged them out of the forest and built her own fence, and you know, I mean, that was my sister and that was her joy, so God bless her, that was it. But I was the kid in the family who was like, I would like to tap dance, <laughs> you know? <laughs> you know? And, um, it, it, so I grew up thinking, I am definitely an oddball in life. You know, I felt like their angles were like this and my line was like that. And so they would look at me like, what's wrong with her? And I would start to look at myself like, what's wrong with me? So I always thought of myself up until that Myers-Briggs test at CARE 11 when I was 38 years old, I thought of myself as the absence of good qualities. I, it was the absence of organizational skills. It was the absence of the desire to work hard physically. It was, um, it was all of those things that had kept me thinking, oh man, I gotta work twice as hard as anybody else because I don't have any great skills to offer. Um, so you start, you start looking for them. You start looking for, you start looking for things that you can do that will give you the, the sense of applause and like, you're okay, you're good. And television, 
and the theater were the two things that I kind of chose, and they fit with who I was because I loved to tell people stories, and I loved to be emotional, and I, I loved to, um, to make sense of emotional things. So that served me in television news. I would tell stories and um, get to interview people, but, and I had great joy when I got a chance to do that, but they also made me do things like go to the legislature. <laughs> oh gosh, if you've ever been to the legislature and tried to ask for truth from somebody, it's a very frustrating place to be, you know? <laughs> uh, I, I didn't mean to be political, but that, that's really more of a, it's, it, it's, it's kind of like they, they have this idea of what they're supposed to tell you, and then there's the truth. And if you're intuitive at all, you can stand there, and as you're asking the question, inside your head you're going, this is not the truth, this is not the truth, but you know you have to put it on the air that night. So you, you knew that what you were putting on the air was, you know, partial fact, and someone's idea of what a fact was. And so that became very frustrating to me. Um, they wouldn't let me go out and do my, the stories that I adored. The ones that won me the National Emmy. Those are the ones that, they, that you know, you had to kind of argue for that one because that was soft news, you know? It was soft. It didn't, it didn't tell you how hard the world was. It told you so, a soft story about the world. So, you know, it didn't, so I had some of the, the sense of like, oh, I am somebody coming from television news, but it still felt empty inside somehow. So I started dreaming about other things to do. And one of the things was um, I wanted to be happier. I wanted to laugh more, you know, to your, I just needed, there wasn't a, as much laughter in television news as you would like there to be. And so I wanted to be more creative and I started dreaming of things that, um, that I wanted to be. Not so much as what I wanted to do because I couldn't get my, put my finger on what I wanted to do. And then one day I was invited to a book club meeting and I said, no, I can't go, I can't go. I've not read the book. And they go, nobody reads the book for book club <laughs> meetings. So don't worry about it. So I, um, I ended up going to this book club meeting and it turned out to be a bunch of media women from around town, like the Ruth Kozlaks and Kevin Burgers and um, you know, people that you would, you would know. Uh, and Kevin Berger was in the kitchen during a little break and I went in there and she goes, would you like to do a show on the Home and Garden Network? I was like, sure. No, I don't know. You know, it was like, it sounded like, yeah, well, there's an idea to get out of television news, but it wasn't, it wasn't what I was dreaming of because I thought, you know, with decorating, it's going to be grab $10,000 and head to the nearest Gabberts and, you know, see what you could buy. And that just didn't sound appealing to me. I was raised in a home by people who were raised during the Great Depression. And so that was... That was more like if you leave a t-shirt laying around, the next time you turn around, it's a rug, you know? I mean, it was that, that, kind, of, that kind of decorating. That, sincerely, that was, it was that kind of decorating. You'd look down into rugs and you'd go, hi, yeah, that was mine. <laughs> um, so, but eventually I found out that they, were, they offered me a, a show where we would decorate for under $500. So it was all about dumpster diving driving the alleyways of Minneapolis, picking up broken things, gluing them back together, giving a good coat of paint, putting them all in a room for under $500. So to me, that was, it felt heaven sent on some level. So I said yes to that, and I did it for 10 years and uh, got to do a lot of really cool things. And I have great, great, great appreciation for it. But I have to say there was still that part of me that just felt like, is this it? Is this all there is to life? It, was, it, was, it, it made me feel so ungrateful, but I wasn't ungrateful. It was just that I couldn't see working another year for a nicer car, working another five years hoping you can get to a nicer suburb, or, you know, it, it, it just felt empty to me on that, on that level. And so uh, it kind of came to a head after I, my husband and my daughter and I had been on vacation, and we were flying back. And, um, and I just thought, I'm going to write my life story. I'm going to write my autobiography. Not for anybody else to read, just because I wanted to see what had gone wrong. You know, why did, where did I take that left turn when I should have taken a right turn? There has to be some answer in here for me. So um, I sat down in the plane, because they make you sit down in planes. Um, pulled out a little yellow legal pad, and I started 
writing what I thought was going to be, you know, she was born in Minneapolis on June 12, 1955, to Robert and Ruth Steffen, and blah, blah, blah. Um, and it didn't come out that way. It, it was almost, you know, I, I've been a writer all my life, so I know what's easy writing, and I know what's hard writing when you just can't come up with the ideas or whatever. This was like almost no writing. It was, um, it was like the words were falling off my pen is the best way that I can describe it. And it came out as a metaphor. And it just flowed out of my pen, you know. Typically, I'm used to working out of here, but it flowed out of, I think it was closer to here. And, um, and then it stopped. And I got a handle on what was happening in the story, but I couldn't finish it to save my life. And so when I got home, I tucked it into my bedroom drawer and I forgot about it for five years. And during those five years, I lived a lot of pressure-filled life. On the outside, it looked really great, but there, well, hmm, not, actually, not that great. My, my sister passed away, my dad passed away. Um, I was taken to court by my ex-brother-in-law for stuff having to do with the estate, which I was in charge of, so I was doing all these organizational Oh, legal things when that wasn't my nature. So it was a time when I felt just a great squeeze play on me. But what came out of that was a gift because I was able to figure out who I was within scenarios like that. I was able to find my boundaries and I was able to find a way to communicate my boundaries simply without fear or tears or nothing wrong with tears. I cry all the time. But, I, you know, I, I, there was a it was an opportunity for me to go, okay, this is who I am, and this is what I will put up with, and this is what I won't put up with, and then this is how I'm gonna take care of myself. So it was a real big learning curve during, during those five years. And then one day I decided to pick, um, I just thought of it, and I went up and I pulled that little yellow legal pad out of my bedroom drawer and went to my kitchen, and the exact same thing happened. And 45 minutes later, I was done, and what, that book showed, or what that story showed to me, was that I had been missing. Um, I, the, the reason that I felt so empty was because I kept trying to fill my life with stuff and accomplishments and people going, yeah, you're doing a great job, but I was missing from my life. I, ha I had forgotten who the little girl was inside of me, the one who knew exactly what she wanted to do, who she needed to be, you know, uh, uh, we squash our kids' curiosity quite often, I think, and what I have come to understand is that curiosity is our direct connection to our soul, to our source. It's, it's saying, this is who you are. Go out and see and ask questions about that and learn about that. And we tend to, to put kids into a little conforming box and say, you can be curious about that on your own time, or you can be curious about, about that in third grade when we study that, but you can't be curious about that now. Um, and so, I, looking back, I see that that's what happened to me, just because it happens to everybody. It's not, it's not my own sense of victimhood that's telling this story. But, um, so I am, it's gonna be story time with Joan. I'm gonna read you this, this book, which is the story almost verbatim from what um, fell off my pen. The, the people at Tristan Publishing here in town were kind enough to just let it be the way it was. They brought in an editor from New York and the editor made all kinds of different, you know, edits and stuff like that. And, and uh, to their credit, they just said, no, this is your story. This is your personal story. And how hypocritical would that be for us to change your story? So um, very appreciative for them. And by the way, the only reason this is published as a book is because my husband was turned down by Tristan Publishing to do a photography book. And he said it was the nicest turn down he had ever gotten. And so he called them back and said, okay, I know you don't want to do my book, but would you take a look at something my wife has written? And so I broke every rule in publishing and, I, you know, they said yes. So I broke every rule in publishing and just went to my computer and attached it to an email and sent it off to them. And uh, they, they said yes. And they said yes to my husband's book the year after that. So he's got a book out there too called Up, Up North. It's a beautiful photography book. So anyway, um, this is my story. And there, it isn't long like Bill Clinton's. It's only, you know, it's not 1,005 pages. It's only 40 with lots of illustrations. <laughs> there once was a little girl, and she sparkled. 
She lived in her magnificence, singing and dancing wherever life took her. In the morning, a finger of sunlight would reach gently through the blinds to tickle her awake, and she would leap from her bed, looking for joy wherever she could find it. And she found it with her toes in the grass, her tiny hands wrapped around a dandelion, her hair tangled from the possibilities for fun that swirled around her. She was enough. At night, she would snuggle under her covers, barely able to wait for the dreams that would take her to even greater places and set the stage for the next day. One morning, though, the sunlight felt sharp, stabbing at sleepy eyes. A little grumble escaped her mouth as she stumbled out of bed. She did dance that day, but not as joyfully, not as she had the day before. And that night, she punched at her pillow, waiting for sleep to take her away from the day, away. Slowly, the people around her noted with pride that the little girl was growing up, learning to act mature, is what they called it. They were doing their jobs well. And so the little girl became a big girl, nicely folding her hands in her lap as she sat very still, wondering why she felt so alone. There was still a part of her that felt like dancing and singing, but that wasn't acceptable most of the time. It might disturb someone. It might not be appropriate. It most certainly wasn't useful. So as the girl grew, she would lock the door of her room when the others left and sing and dance and visit the little girl inside, being careful to be just a little quiet so she could hear if anyone returned. The girl grew and became ever more dutiful. No one saw her dance, no one heard her sing. She memorized the answers others gave her for who she was, and soon it seemed even she forgot her little girl. To be sure, there were days when it looked as though the girl was happy, but the smiles were usually on the outside, not the inside. Life went on for the girl, now a woman, and her life looked a lot like everyone else's. She was told that was success. Life, they said, is all about fitting in. Don't ask questions, it makes us all a little uncomfortable and you don't want that. So the woman spent her days waking up and waiting to fall asleep. She wasn't aware the little girl was patiently waiting for her, reaching out in small ways every day and every night. But one morning she felt a familiar tickle. The sunlight played on her face for a moment and it made her smile. An energy she hadn't felt in some time lifted her out of bed and she sensed something familiar and yet somehow it was new. That day was more ordinary than not, but from time to time she was filled with hope, which rose in waves and then disappeared into the ordinary. She went to bed that night happier than usual, but slightly confused at what the day had been about. The next day dawned and the woman again sensed something familiar and exciting in the sunlight. In fact, she felt so alive in that moment. She danced out of bed and down the hall silently so no one would hear her. Moments in the day found her quietly humming to herself, dancing in her dreams while she lived the life she thought she should. And she went to bed that night not as anxious to sleep as anxious to be awake again. And the months went on that way with joy dancing just below the surface of the woman. As the years went by, the woman became bolder, discovering things about herself she had somehow forgotten. She spent time every day hungrily uncovering pieces of a little girl from long ago, and she decided she could no longer only be the person others expected to see. She was that, but she was so much more. She had always been so much more. She decided to share who she was with the world and with herself. There was magic to be remembered. And there was that urgent and now familiar rhythm that kept her dancing and looking for new songs to sing. <laughs> some people didn't really like that. They had come to depend on her the way she used to be. Now she made some of them uncomfortable, even angry. Are people really supposed to listen to their own rhythm and dance, they asked, or should they march in the quiet lines laid out for them? It didn't matter to her. She didn't want to tell anyone else what to do. The only thing that mattered to the woman was the voice of the little girl living in her heart, whispering softly that she was indeed enough. She was magnificent and she sparkled. So that is the story that wrote itself on the... Um, <laughs> So that was the story that wrote it, thank you. That was the story that wrote itself on the plane and wrote itself in my kitchen. And um, the sad thing about that book to me is that, and it's also lovely in some ways, people come up to me and they go, you wrote my story, you wrote my story. And it's like, how 
Sad is that, that we're all living in our own little silos, you know, feeling alone and different and not loved enough for who we are and looking for something else to do that will make us more acceptable. Um, you know, why don't we just <laughs> break down those silos? Um, in fact, there's a, a rebellious Catholic priest named Richard Rohr. I don't know if anybody knows Richard Rohr. Um, but he says, and I love this, he says, the first half of your life you build the container, which you know is obviously, it's like I have to make sure everything looks good and I have to worry about my container and the house and the car. And You built your container and the second half of your life you fill your container. And I think that was the calling that, was, was, that just kept knocking at my head. I like to say now that um, the first third of your life you build the container, the second third of your life you fill the container, and the third half of your life you open the container and let it spill out. Um, also, I just have to share a quote from my all-time favorite boyfriend, Albert Einstein. Um, I have grown to love this man. <laughs> and my favorite quote from him, which really um, kind of coincides with what the book is all about, is, everybody is a genius. Everybody is a genius. Even from Albert, he says, everybody's a genius. But if you, if, um, if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will spend its whole life believing it's stupid. And I think we do that to, to one another. It's like, why aren't you more like me? Why don't you think more like me? Why don't you get up and scrub the floor? Why don't you, you know, cut down the trees and build the fences? It's like, because we're supposed to be different and brilliant in our own way. And what that book has allowed me to do is to, to, to know that I have brilliance and to know that I have the capacity to affect change. And um, it allowed me to dream really big. I formed a nonprofit called Peace Begins With Me. And I don't mean that in just like me, this is it, peace begins just with me. Peace begins with each individual heart. Um, and, and especially in this time of the political, I don't even know what kind word to use, just the politics of this season, uh, I think that there is a lot to be said about remembering what you can do. There's, there's a lot of finger pointing that happens in our world right now. It's like, I can't believe they said that. Look at, they said this. I can't believe they did that. I can't believe the Mideast is doing, I can't believe what, you know, and calling for peace and pointing fingers and asking for peace, but then not embodying it in the way that really can affect the world. It's like, this is not gonna change the world, but this, will for certain at least change your world, you know? So um, that's what Peace Begins With Me is all about. It's a, it's a really simple inner peace movement. It's an inner peace project because I know about, I know that energy is real. That part of the invisible, I know who we are, the, the energy that we carry into the world, it affects the world. I mean, we've all had the experience of, haven't we, of somebody giving us the finger out of the blue on the freeway? It's like, boom, <laughs> you know, it's like, you feel it. Or having somebody walk into a room in a horrible mood, you know, all of a sudden you can feel the energy of that shift. Um, there is a, a wonderful orthomolecular psychiatrist by the name of Dr. David Hawkins. If anybody's read his work, I love, he just passed away, unfortunately, about almost a month ago now but um, I adore him. He had a big spiritual awakening, probably when he was in his 40s. He, he at the time, had the largest psychiatric practice in Manhattan, and he had this spiritual awakening, and immediately packed his stuff, drove to Sedona, Arizona, and spent time pondering it, just being, and then using his scientific methodology to look at spirit and his spiritual awakening. And the conclusion that he came to is that one, one conscious, loving person can balance out three quarters of a million who are not. Isn't that astounding? I know, so you say, oh, I can't do it. What, what difference would it make if I live my life, if I find more peace within myself or find more peace within my family? What difference is it gonna make? Well, you could be balancing out three quarters of a million people, and that's just at the level of, of love. You can go beyond that. I mean, we all know that this consciousness thing is gonna go ad infinitum. But just think about the 
balancing act. I mean, we're saying that love is more powerful than fear, basically, and anger and all that. So, so this is just asking, and, and I keep pointing to this card because part of, part of what um, we're doing is just an awareness campaign, and we're calling this our hero card, and it just says, um, it's to give to somebody that you see on the street who's just embodying some kind of love, whether it's a smile at you or whatever. So it says, you are a hero. It might have been your smile. It might have been a real connected conversation. It might have been as simple as you really seeing me or you, know, you really being you. That's a hero in my book, in a world that can feel disconnected. So initial this card, pass it on to the next hero you meet and see how long it takes to get back to you. Um, so I, I have a bunch of these out there. If anybody wants them, I would love if you would, you know, s spend the currency of kindness. I think that would be awesome. Um, so that's. I just want to say something about heroes too. I think I think heroes in our culture we've tended to look at people who are on TV in some kind of heroic status. People who have made lots of money they sometimes get hero status. I remember Governor Mark Dayton calling Ziggy Wilf a hero for for the millions of dollars he put into the <laughs> into the new stadium. And I thought, well, I think that's that's a weird use of the word hero. Um, but um, so, you know, heroes climb mountains and ride bikes in races and, you know, those are the heroes. In, in my mind and in the mind of the Peace Begins With Me project, the heroes, I think, are the ones who dare to break through the shells that we all kind of carry with us sometimes and look people in the eye and smile, <laughs> you know? Or the heroes are, I think, I think the people with the most potential for heroism in our culture are the people who are standing behind counters and having hundreds of people file by them every day. I don't know that they know the power that they have, but I'd like them to alert them to the fact that there's tremendous power in standing behind a counter, you know, at Bibolo or Target and um, offering, offering an energy of compassion or understanding or love or just, you may be, the, that may be the only person who actually looks somebody in the eye that day and they get a smile from them. They may go, may go home without, any human contact if that person doesn't offer it to them. So I, I, I would, our hope is that we can, we can get inside some of the corporations and have them start to really honor the individual that way. Um, and out of that project, I know I'm almost done. Um, out of that project came this second book. Tristan asked me to write another book because every time I'd go out and speak on And She Sparkled, I'd start talking about peace. So they said, why don't you just write a book on it? And uh, so I did. It's called Peace In, Peace Out. And it's half journal because I don't have the wisdom. You know, I, I have my wisdom, but I don't have your wisdom. So there's a half of a journal to, uh, for you to excavate your own story and wisdom. Um, but it's all just really, really simple. On this side, it's always simple ways to ask yourself what's really true in your life. Am I really stubborn like my parents said, or can I think about that in a different way and, and honor the gift that it was actually displaying? So small ways that you can honor who you are and love who you are, and then on the right-hand side, there are just small ways that you can reach out to the world and honor who um, the other person is. So it's a, it's a very simple book. I will, I will read you one. I don't know which one. Um, uh, I have no idea what this is because I can't read it without my glasses, so I'll just read it. Um, I think it's time for a break. This is called Peace In. I think it's time for a break. The culture has been telling you since you were born that you need to compete and work harder than everyone else in order to achieve success. I have no problem with working passionately, but even working passionately, you need time to relax and recharge and fill your cup. It's not a want, it's a need if you're going to contribute your best and live a conscious, loving life. Give yourself a break. Listen to what your career needs and listen to what you need. Strike a balance today. And for the peace out, it says, take off the judge's robes. Give someone else a break today, too. Everybody's human. Everybody has issues. Everybody makes mistakes everybody. Um, so it's just simple, simple things like that, um, that I'm, I'm really grateful they gave me the opportunity to do this. And when you're talking about recharging and filling your cup, I just get this image of, you know, like our world is set up on peace in, peace out, breath in, breath out. Can you imagine? We're, we're a culture that, that applauds people and builds statues to people who work way too much, you know? We just applaud that. And, but, but think about it in terms of a breath, you know? Working way too hard is like, 
you know, breath out, breath out, breath out, breath out, breath out. Um, we need to be selfish enough and reclaim that word selfish for, to take care of who we are so we have something loving to put back out into the world. Um, I have one little quote here that really kind of sums it up for me. And it's a, an inscription that was found in Westminster Abbey on the tomb of an Anglican bishop. I can't remember what, what century it's from, but it was a long time ago. And he said, when I was young and free and my imagination had no limits, I dreamed of changing the world. As I grew older and wiser, I discovered the world would not change. So I shortened my sights somewhat and decided to change only my country, but it too seemed immovable. As I grew into my twilight years in one last desperate attempt, I settled for changing only my family, those closest to me, but alas, they would have none of it. And now I realize as I lie on my deathbed, if I had only changed myself first, then by example, I might have changed my family. From their inspiration and encouragement, I would then have been able to better my country. And who knows, I might have even changed the world. So I love that. Um, so I will leave you with, remember who you are. You are brilliant and magnificent, and you have a piece of the puzzle that is necessary for the, the evolution of our world. Don't discount that, you really are brilliant. Then be who you are, because being who you are is the, the doing of the, the, the remembering. You have to be who you are, and sometimes it's difficult in this world because the world says, no, you must be a little bit more like everybody else. We need to homogenize you in some way. Um, and so have the courage to be who you are and then share who you are. When you walk down the street, know that the person that you're walking past, you are impacting them in some way. So even if you can't say hello or you can't put a sparkle in your eye, put a kind thought in your eye for that person. It'll make a difference as to how you feel walking through the world, so share who you are. And that, I believe, will change the world. So thank you for letting me come here today. I really appreciate it. <laughs>